Hello, everyone, and welcome to the December 2018 War Room. My name is Praveen Danta, and my co-founder, Raju Deshi, will be joining us shortly. But uh, let's stay on track and get started here and talk about, well, we saw it again today. You know, I didn't look at the market in the last 15 minutes to the close, but we certainly turned south after the uh, Fed began to uh, talk about its reasoning behind a rate hike and really with uh, two rate hikes planned for the, uh, the coming year. Perhaps that was beyond market expectation and hopes for, for a slowdown. But uh, we'll talk about that a little further today and we'll talk about some of the other pressures in the market. And if I jump into our outline here, we're gonna talk about what's going on in Q4 of 2018, what happened? And then we'll move into 2019 economic outlook both again from a perspective of you know what's going on with the fed what's going on with employment and other key indicators uh and uh also uh talk about major portions of the uh stock market namely we're going to continue a conversation about the fangs that we started last month and talk about valuations a little bit more uh, one of the key points we want to talk about this month is how bad can a correction get without a recession because not all corrections are tied to recessions. And we really wanna assess what's the magnitude that's possible, what's the risk there. And then finally, we'll be presenting uh, an update to our tech bubble scenario. Since a lot of the blowdown that we've seen has been related to uh, the so-called FANG stocks, tech mega cap. We'll be talking about that in more detail. And uh, Raj, I believe, uh, are you with us? Now we can get started with uh, the skinny. Good afternoon, Praveen. I am here. All right. Well, let's uh, discuss why the topic is uh, is ripe to talk about, uh, you know, not just these dark days, which that's obvious, but really what else is going on and, and why tech a little more and all of that. Praveen, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Raj. Go ahead. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, uh, before uh, we get to it, uh, you know, the, no need to belabor what's been happening. Uh, S&P now and NASDAQ both uh, below their 2018 lows. Uh, not really often seen. You know, we always hear about uh, Santa rallies uh, in December, all kinds of retail stocks flying and uh, tech purchases making the NASDAQ go up, ending the year on a high note, even if it's just a, a conspiracy theories around smart money trying to uh, take profits before the new year, et cetera. This year is the exact opposite of that, uh, where the, uh, the kind of downturn in leadership for tech has continued. We've been talking about that for a couple months now. And the peak fang kind of scenario outcome, uh, this kind of tech leadership paradigm, is that over? That's been in the play for, since uh, in a couple different scenarios, both business cycle, sunset, as well as the tech bubble uh, specific scenario. Uh, since then, we've had more bad news about China and the kind of oil story, somewhat intertwined stories about industrial nations uh, using, uh, decreasing in their output, et cetera, th their GDP slowing down, that affects oil prices and uh, both tech and the uh, China story uh, in disarray completely destroys crypto. Uh, so a year ago, I think we had uh, 20,000 on Bitcoin and now somewhere below 4,000, somewhere between 3,000 and 4,000. I really don't care. And most people don't, uh, as you'll notice from uh, the decrease in, in searches for cryptocurrencies. So all of that together, making a kind of hellish December, you know, we try to be even handed between uh, the good, bad and ugly outcomes in the economy, but easily uh, we can say dark days of 2018. So. And that's right. And, and let's um, let's move into it now, maybe a little bit further and take a look on hidden levers. So let me jump out for a moment here and I'll jump into hidden levers. And I've logged in just to look at the scenario library because, you know, as we talk about, you know, we're, perhaps it's uh, a little bit foreboding this idea of dark days, but we've got a lot of scenarios in play right now. And I think that's really the reason why. The business cycle sunset, the idea that perhaps the business cycle is coming to an end is one scenario that we covered last month, uh, but uh, definitely still in play. The tech bubble, we saw uh, uh, Facebook actually 
down, well, I don't know what it was at the close, but between six and 8% perhaps, uh, you know, as a result of some, some company specific bad news, but, uh, but also the general, general downdraft across, uh, you know, those so-called FANG stocks. And so you'll note that for those of you who have followed our scenarios for some time, we've updated the tech bubble uh, imagery there to really call out the FANGs as well. And then the trade war, that sort of background noise almost at the moment because it's not front and center. But uh, there are indications that it's impacting the Chinese economy. And, uh, you know, when we've covered emerging markets and, and sort of global economic growth issues, we've mentioned this several times, and I'll say it again, China is responsible for roughly 50% of global economic growth. And so uh, slowdown in China is at some level felt all over the world. So if our trade policies, you know, they didn't seem to be having a huge amount of impact in the U.S. yet, but if they are slowing down demand for uh, Chinese goods at all, then uh, then that backlash ripple effect, that, that's sort of one of the questions that, that could be in play there. So three different scenarios. We're going to cover the tech bubble in more detail today. Um, if I drill into these just real quick, one of the things I wanted to note was that in both the business cycle sunset, we'll see that there's a notion of a peak fangs type scenario. And that's also true in the tech bubble, that that's the downside. That's actually considered the, the deepest downside that we will talk about outside of historical scenarios. Uh, and, and so we'll be looking at that here as well. So um, something to keep in mind that, uh, you know, some, sometimes the outcomes overlap across different, uh, different groups of scenarios because, uh, you know, the directions are sort of pointing in an online manner. All right. Well, if we jump back in now. Raj, why don't you take us through the takeaways for those who don't have a whole lot of time today? Okay, if you've got two minutes uh, and, and an attention span like mine, uh, you need you need the information fast. Uh, if we can get to the takeaway slide, Praveen. You should see it there, Raj. I'm... There you go. Okay, well, you know, one thing we know as of uh, about in two hours ago, uh, not even, Artificially low rates are indeed over. You know, whatever uh, put there was from the Fed, uh, usually on rates uh, announcements days from the Yellen era, kind of helping the markets lift up in that melt up. Uh, and then before that, the Bernanke era, before that, the Greenspan era. That is not the case here. You know, uh, toward the beginning of uh, this year, uh, we had discussed the new Fed hawks that were put in place after the Yellen uh, retirement or, uh, term was over. And that has held up those new Fed hawks, uh, you know, incapable of being politicized like the Supreme Court or other bodies, which, uh, you know, are supposed to be balanced, not politicized. Uh, same with um, and uh, no matter what's happening, we can kind of count on this. And, it, you know, even in the Yellen era, that taper did happen uh, on schedule. And so everything that we've been warned about or told is happening in the quantity that we've been told and on the pace we've been told. So anybody who's surprised in your position as an advisor, it's really not surprising. You know, if there's uh, all kinds of sensationalism around bullishness for the common investor or the, the lay person, you know, that is still somewhat caveat and tour, but they are, you know, for financial professionals, we've been told this. And so preparing for it, uh, not only by using hidden levers, but by your investment decisions, models, allocations, um, whatever that may be, you, you had, you were warned, you know, and so th that, that decade of low rates that people got used to, that Kool-Aid is now, uh, now not being, uh, you can't drink that Kool-Aid anymore. Uh, in terms of this correction, you know, we remember the 87 crash, that was very much in an upward uh, skyrocketing uh, GDP scenario and a bull market in general. So that was still a 33% hit. And so party fouls can happen, uh, you know, even at the best parties, there are bad things that happen. And so uh, those corrections can happen in good times and they can hit hard. And that's exactly what's happening now. You'll see that as we discuss the, the economic vital signs versus market vital signs. It's a huge contrast. Uh, Fangs, uh, you will notice, you know, all they, they got spanked today uh, and it's been continuing you know, one after another. You know, you may feel like Job uh, if you're a tech, uh, tech enthusiast. But really, you know, fair value will show you why it's 20% uh, below where we are right now, maybe more um, from here. In, in terms of the larger picture for tech, you know, keep in mind this recurring image of uh, uh, cannibalization, fish eating fish, that kind of thing. Uh, 
the monopolies as in other industries, more established industries in the United States, tech is only growing as a monopoly. And frankly, the government is looking the other way. Um, despite this correction, and uh, maybe there's one or two uh, victims and maybe they die, um, just like uh, America Online died, just like no one cares about Cisco anymore, even though it's a tech stalwart. Uh, so, so the fangs kind of conglomerate, you know, the way we talk about it, that may die, that, that can't last forever. But the tech monopoly as an industry, you know, that kind of um, juggernaut, that's only growing despite this correction. Yeah, we, we continue to see, uh, you know, when they're promising entrance that, you know, some of the big tech companies will buy them up rather than face competition. And, uh, and so we see it in, uh, you know, in the dominance. Uh, across ad between advertising, Google and Facebook have pretty much split the online advertising market 50-50. There is, you know, just little dribbles beyond the two of them. And so there are other examples in, in, um, you know, some of those industries, you know, between Apple and Samsung, that's essentially your entire smartphone market and so on. You know, you've got bit players, uh, but in the U.S., you know, they command a, you know, the lion's share by far. So more and more examples of that. All right, well, let's move on and talk about what's been going on this quarter. And of course, many of you, are, you know, of course, you guys, you're all aware of what's going on in a broader sense. We're not really talking about just overall market action. And even this top, the chart at top left, you're all familiar, no doubt, or many of you are familiar with the year to date sort of action on a lot of the so called FANG stocks, you know, Facebook, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google, which are all indicated up here. Facebook is actually the only one, and this chart was made based on yesterday's close. Of course, we had some more movement downward today. Uh, but Facebook is the only one that is materially down for the year, facing some more unique challenges around, uh, well, uh, today's hit was due to more data breaches, but, uh, but other issues in, in their business. Uh, but Google and Apple essentially flat for the year, even after the burn off that we've experienced over the last couple of months. And then Amazon is still up, uh, you know, roughly 25%. Netflix is up still a decent bit more than that. So it's not as though they've, you know, come down to earth, so to speak, yet. They've just come down from the absolute peaks met earlier in the year. Now, what we decided to do was to take and, and, and was to take the fangs as a whole. Let's use a, a standard sort of future cash flow stock valuation model. And so, you know, for those of you who are familiar, the way that typically works is what is, you know, why do you buy a stock? What is the stock really worth? Well, it's worth the sum of its discounted future cash flows as paid back to the investors. You know, typically you think of that as being paid back via dividends. Now, as we know, many of these stocks don't, of course, today pay dividends. But the theory, you know, in the stock market is that eventually a company will grow and grow and grow. And as it slows down, it will begin to pay shareholder returns as dividends. So traditional valuation models, that's what they work against. Um, so what we did here was we decided to take a particular one. This is this uh, DQY DJ discount model, and uh, I've actually got it open. I can show it to you here. It's a um, it's a nice little tool as far as doing valuation exercises like this. And uh, I was plugging in some some different numbers. You know, it actually has some more advanced options. But the bottom line is that we were plugging in the current valuation of the Fangs as a whole. So 2.68 trillion. Uh, is uh, roughly today's number or end of yesterday's number. And the question we're asking is, if we're assuming a discount rate of 10%, we're trying to figure out what is the fair value of the stock so that a 10% long-term return is, is uh, supported, essentially. So here in dividends, we plug in, we could get into the nuances and details of how to exactly model it, but essentially we plug in their operating income because most of them don't pay dividends. Uh, and so we just plugged in their operating income, put in a healthy estimate, and this is based on, there's an NYU professor who does a lot of valuation work on what their actual growth rates, this is their operating income growth rate here, since they don't have dividends again. So plug all of these numbers in, and what you get is an estimate that fair value is actually about, well, that they're rather, they're overvalued around 19%. And, uh, you know, if you change any of these assumptions, so if I, you know, say, oh, what if they only grow at 30% per year? And then I hit recalculate. Well, then all of a sudden we see that they're 34% overvalued. So you can play with all the assumptions and there's advanced assumptions as well. So it's a nice little model just for doing some basic analysis in this vein. 
what we did uh, for the slide was we actually used the full year end 2017 number since most of the stocks have normalized back to year end 2017 levels and since that data is complete. So using that as inputs, we found it more like a 21% overvaluation. And again, so this is basic math, you know, based on what is that gross rate going to be over the next five years? And then after that, assume that it normalizes to, uh, to little or no future income growth, just sort of, you know, flatlining after that. Uh, but the bottom line point here is that when you look at it on this basis, there is still that valuation overhang. So to cure that, these FANG stocks probably need to drop another 15 to 20%. And, uh, you know, investors may want to take heed. Of course, as interest rates rise, the discount rate that investors may want may rise further. And so that would put further pressure on this model as well. Praveen, uh, how long has uh, FANGs been a term, really? That's a good question, Roger. You know, I feel like it's been, you know, roughly what, the last five years has been longer than that. You know, it's all of these companies, some of them are actually quite old, uh, even in public markets, because Netflix has been public since the DVD days. Google's been public since the first dot-com bubble. Of course, Apple is an old company at this point in some sense. Amazon, too, has been public since its old book days in 2000. So um, of it's this group, it's really just Facebook. Facebook's yeah. the only new IPO of the bunch. Uh, so, but I'm not sure. You know, it, it's definitely been at least five years. I know there's whole uh, ETFs based on these uh, this random bundle of tech companies, right? And we're seeing inclusion in this kind of pseudo exclusive club as a great thing. I know the Square was mentioned uh, as a potential new fang, and then it skyrocketed. And as we know, uh, it subsequently lost all that. Uh, we've but we've seen other juggernauts like Microsoft, let's say, who mm -hmm. who aren't included in this, who you know could could easily easily be i wonder why not yeah arguably and we've seen that you know so some folks replaced the n with the m for microsoft uh because unlike netflix which is you know 100 billion market cap give or take microsoft is vying to be the largest company in the world again along with apple and amazon so so that there's a good argument that microsoft is actually the one that fits here and not netflix but uh i guess maybe for branding reasons it doesn't sound that great to say fam or whatever that would be <laughs> and so uh <laughs> that hasn't stuck as well. But at any rate, when you look at them as a whole, you do see this, overvalu this valuation overhang. Incidentally, I tried some of them individually. Outside of Facebook, even Apple was still showing, you know, via this kind of basic uh, cash flow model, was still showing a little bit of evaluation overhang. Uh, Google as well. So even the companies that have a lot of operating income uh, and even net income and even dividends with Apple are still showing some valuation overhang. Uh, Netflix and Amazon, are sky high, and so those two would be uh, would be arguably even you know the most overvalued of the bunch. Unless you believe the 100% growth rates, which if they can do it, you know more power to them, and then and then it it becomes real, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, the next big topic, you know, in terms of what's going on right now that we want to make sure we cover, and uh, well, it's what happened today with our new Fed Chair Powell and continuing of the rate hike cycle. And Raj, you mentioned this, but what we thought was interesting was to put together uh, some analysis of, okay, how is the yield curve likely to change based on the hike today? So the bottom left chart, this is based on the September rate hike. So after the September rate hike, we looked at the charts and we found that for all of the time, for all of the treasuries with maturities shorter, than um, six months, actually shorter than one year. That might be a typo because even the one year holds it to some extent. But all of the shorter range uh, treasuries, all 25 basis points stays baked into the cake after the rate hike. But for the longer dated treasuries, so two years and longer, it bleeds off. And from September until today, that 25 basis points hike, it started out in the two year treasuries as well. And then all of it came out. And so what that means is that when you've got this kind of curve convergence, what does that mean? Well, that means the yield curve is getting closer and closer to inverting is what it means. And that's the chart at the top right there, which is showing a projected shift. If all of the short part of the curve uh, moves up 25 basis points, then, you know, perhaps as, as soon as the end of this year, if not sooner, you may see the one-year treasury be higher than the 10-year, 
And so, uh, you, you know, you'll start to see more and more of the curve invert. And even the six-month treasury, in fact, may be at the same level as the 10-year. So, uh, you know, that's the beginnings of a real inversion. When you, when you throw in the fact that uh, the Fed chair has called for, or that the, the, Fed, the Fed as a whole, that they're predicting two more hikes in 2019, well, absent a big rise in 10-year rates, that's going to lead to inversion across the board. Uh, the crucial point, which I think most, most everyone's familiar with, being that the yield curve has inverted before each of the last five recessions. And, uh, and so that's really been why, why folks are following that so closely. What kind of lag do we usually get with those past five inversions, Praveen? So we've typically seen a lag that's, you know, in a, in the, around a year. It could be as long as 18 months, but it's, it's not an instantaneous sort of thing. At the same time, now it's become a very popular indicator. And so it seems like the market is starting to uh, take heed of that and is selling off at the mere threat of a yield curve. It's certainly, you know, come up in the discussion of maybe why some folks are, are getting more defensive. But, uh, but the, the thing that I always like to point out when we talk about the yield curve is it's not just some, you know, there's a lot of indicators out there, whether they're technical indicators, uh, some even fundamental or macro, uh, but not all of the indicators have a very direct path to actual impact on the markets the way that the yield curve does. And the reason for that is, uh, well, the simplest reason is that when short-term rates rise, then on the margin, you're going to see more and more people willing to invest in savings accounts and CDs and other risk-free assets instead of the stock market. So by definition, you know, and I, I look to my parents as being the, you know, obvious example of investors like that who are starting to roll assets out of the stock market and into risk-free assets. Uh, but the higher that rate gets, so now we saw just the other day Robinhood, which is, a, you know, one of the new, new age brokerages out there, they are promising 3% savings account. So 3% savings, you know, that, that's not terribly bad. You could see it with a couple more hikes that they might be offering three and a half, four 4% savings. Uh, you know, if you're offering 4% savings, then for a larger and larger percentage of investors, that's competitive. You know, instead of taking a risk in the stock market, they'd rather just take that. And so there's a real impact there that's not, you know, some type of hocus pocus indicator. No, it's just real life. It's just microeconomics. People choose that investment instead of taking risk. Uh, Praveen, we have yield curve inversion as a scenario outcome. Could you show that on the site? Yes, let's take a look. And, you know, you mentioned earlier, Raj, so you mentioned new Fed hawks, which I think is a key scenario that's good for us to point out as we're talking about so many different scenarios being in play right now. So here's our good friend, the Fed chair under new Fed hawks, that image at the right there. And if I click on the scenario details there, we see that the downside scenario in that case is yield curve inversion. And uh, it's, the, it's sort of the, the ugliest case uh, possible in in that group of scenarios. So there is some, some substantial downside on the table. And this is sort of the, the scenario where the yield curve inversion really does come as an advanced indicator of we're turning the corner into a recession, which as we'll see in a little bit here, there's a lot of conflicting signals that say there's a lot of reasons to believe that we're not necessarily getting to that point where we have a recession. So there is a little bit of conflict in the data. All right. Even, well, Raj, you mentioned how 87 that, was one of the worst crashes, uh, but in looking at corrections in good times, what else do we see here? Well, one thing we thought, you know, we do uh, love the Nate Silver type analysis. Show me uh, the past events when this happened so I know how to couch my uh, expectations. And so what we can see uh, besides the 1987 kind of world famous crash now, uh, you've got a slew of t uh, party fouls, you can say, you know, times when there was a upward trending GDP and uh, a downward trending market. That's uh, kind of crazy, right? But the market does look 12 to 18 months out. And so there were jitters. Maybe it was a, a period of reflection or a period of consolidation. We know nothing moves in a straight line. Uh, that's just not the way things are. But you can see there where the red circles are. Uh, identifying the kind of the moments in time uh, none longer than uh, none longer than a year uh, 
where there was a, a healthy correction in the market. And there was a correction because after that, it uh, resumed an upward trend. Enough to register here for, at a glance in uh, the chart, but nonetheless that. So the question becomes, uh, this, this current M shape that you're seeing at the top right of the chart, is that going to be like these previous four examples, or is it going to be a serious uh, you know, sea change back toward a bear market? And, and so, you know, where, where could we go? We could go up to a 33% correction. We know that uh, the lion's share of that uh, 87 summer uh, and fall downside move was due to one day being uh, the Black Black Friday, I think, October 87. Um, I think it was a Friday, it could have been a Monday. It's, you know, it's, it's lost in folklore, but really that was due to a Fed trying to pierce and equity bubbles in, in the 80s, bright lights, big city boom. You know, the, those days when uh, Microsoft and Apple, let's say, got their real legs, Oracle too. And so you had, it wasn't the fangs then, but it was another set of tech leaders. And, uh, you know, we're not anticipating something like that now. Uh, even today's dovish language takes away from that already, right? Uh, but easily, uh, we've, we've hit 13%. You can easily see a 20% or low 20s, just if you average those numbers uh, on peak to trough, it's not, it, it shouldn't be a huge surprise. And so that significant room to correct from here without any recession on the horizon could happen. Um, and in terms of, you know, where we put the threshold for making it into this table, uh, even that company is quite exclusive. Uh, originally, the analysis was, let's see where there's more than anything that's north of a 10% correction, double digit correction in good times. And guess what? It was just too many to count. So they didn't make it. So we upped that to about uh, you know 13%, 14% really. Uh, and so September, 2018, which is when this um, correction started, it, is, it hasn't even pierced that 14% level. Uh, perhaps after today it did actually. So this is uh, up to, uh, this afternoon, but we did not include today's move. So now we're finally in the club with the 28 end of 2018 downside move. Right. And um, yeah, I mean, 10%, of course, as we know, although we've had a relatively low volatility bull market over the last decade uh, since 2009, you know, of course, there've been a couple of these, excluding the current one. There's still two other patches that were greater than uh, 10%. But 10% downside moves happen on average every other year. And so, yeah, there would have been, you know, another 15 or 20 to add to this list, just looking at the time frame involved. And so they are just too numerous yeah. to mention. We just had gotten, we got, we got unused to them because the, the rally in 2015, 20, you know, 2016, 2017, uh, well, really actually it's this rally in between here from, you know, after this 2011, 2012, all the way until 2015 was very low volatility. And uh, and again, last year. Uh, but here we are, you know, if, if that's the boundary that minus 23, you know, to your point, Raj, roughly or minus 33 with with uh, roughly 23 of that coming on one day. But there was actually another 10 percent after that uh, or kind of before and after, mostly after. Uh, and uh, and so. You know, it, it is possible to have that degree of substantial move within a bull market, because as we know, as we look at this. This was a full three years before a recession, but totally, essentially totally unrelated to the, the following recession. Praveen, um, in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of this current M shape, uh, I can't help but notice that it does resemble that big M in, uh, in the 20, I guess the 2007, 2008 era. Uh, how about we take a look at the economy at large to see what's looming for the next year or two? Yeah, let's see, you know, well, so what are the potential factors to keep in mind? You know, and, and part of what we wanted to look at here was not just the factors um, that might impact the markets, but also what is the Fed looking at? As we saw today, you know, there was some question around would the Fed take into account the um, equity drawdown in particular, you know, and maybe slow down. And what we saw instead was that, you know, they're really looking at the core indicators, 
they did add it to their statement that they are looking at, you know, global economic conditions and market conditions and volatility and things like that. So they're not disregarding it completely, but it's only one factor. And so here what we're looking at in this larger chart from FRED, which is the, uh, the Federal Reserve Economic Database. So the red line here is the unemployment rate. That's the standard youth rate unemployment. So the one that everybody is used to hearing um, the quote for. So the one that's currently at 3.7% roughly and which has trended downward since the last recession steadily. The blue line is hourly earnings, private sector workers' hourly earnings. Well, the growth in, in private sector hourly earnings over time. So as we can see, the bottom of the chart is 1%. And we definitely see this inverse relationship. So there is still an inverse relationship between the rate of unemployment and the uh, hourly growth in, in hourly wages for uh, employees. And that's a good thing. You know, at least, at least it means that on the margin when there are uh, less folks unemployed or there are more folks that are employed, so less available workers, that to some extent there has been wage increase. Not as fast perhaps as it used to be, for instance, just taking a look at the rate of increase uh, before the 08 crisis in that last economic run. It's, a, it's been slower and shallower this time, but it is still going in the right direction. So this is some of what's been being taken into account. If you look at, well, what is this average hourly earnings? Well, guess what that feeds into? That feeds into inflation. So now it's over 3%. So that's feeding into core inflation. And the Fed's mandate is what? The Fed's mandate is to get this red line of unemployment down as low as possible while keeping the blue line, which is a component of inflation, but keep overall inflation. In particular, they look at core inflation. So they are looking at wages keep this from getting the growth rate here from getting too hot. Uh, so that when we ask the question, well, why did the Fed hike today? Why is the Fed still talking about hiking? It's because unemployment is back at historic lows and it hasn't been at this level since the 70s, early 70s, I believe. And, uh, and so that, that's definitely a factor in their calculus. Another factor in their calculus is that, oh, okay, we do finally have some wage growth again, which we don't want that to stoke inflation. So it's time to get rates back to neutral. So. So that's the basic calculus that the Fed is going to be looking at. Now, on the flip side is this statement, this idea that, well, yes, it's true that unemployment is low, but what about all those folks that don't even care to try to get a job anymore? And that's what we see on the right-hand side of the slide, the prime age labor force participation rate by education. What we see is that for men in particular, uh, we see this consistent downtrend and it's gotten worse over time. But for those with less than a you know, high school degree or less, uh, the labor force participation rate is sort of at an all time low for men. And it stayed pretty steady for those with a college education, still up in the 90s, 94%. It's fallen a, a bit, but it's still up in the 90s. But for those without as much education, it's fallen more drastically. And um, this excludes, incidentally, you know, the, these statistics exclude people in prison, they exclude people in the military because you're not allowed to quit the military if you don't want to once you join. So it, it excludes a lot, of, a lot of those populations that maybe not, don't have choice. And so therefore, I mean, when we think about culturally, historically, what do men of prime age, so something like 25 to 55, what else do men of that age typically do? Uh, well, it's work. And that's why historically you saw these numbers be quite high. And, and, and the fact that they're falling off, that's troubling. So this is this idea that skilled labor is at full employment. That's what this unemployment rate is showing. But unskilled labor, that is, you know, those folks are really struggling. And we see it on the women's side of the equation, too, not quite as sharply. But we do see it on both sides, that with unskilled or less skilled labor, that there is actually a lot of slack. And uh, at the same time, the Fed can't really control for this. It's beyond their scope. They, they can just work on the inflation and employment, overall employment side of the picture. So they do what they do, and, and that's why they're raising rates. Would you uh, would you intertwine that story with the technology story? I mean, uh, you know, we, despite the Yeah, you know, there's a, well, so Raj, I was, I was hedging before you asked, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. So there's a writer who writes on, it sort of a, writes on futurists and sort of tech topics. Um, he is a uh, philosopher slash historian slash writer from um, actually from an Israeli university. Uh, his name is Yuval Hariri. Some of you may have heard of him, but uh, he he's sort of kind of extreme on this topic. And there's a lot of talk about how tech is really one of the primary forces displacing 
unskilled labor. Without a doubt, that's true, because even to the extent that jobs like mining still exist, and they do still exist, the, the equipment has caused the uh, amount of people needed to mine, say, a ton of iron ore or a ton of coal. It has cut the number of people required since, let's say, the 50s by like 90%. So that's a form of unemployment that we don't often think about, that, oh, it, it really is machines doing heavy labor. Uh, and that's been true throughout history, but it certainly is happening today as well. And then now you're starting to see it more. We're seeing robots flipping burgers and stuff like that. So anyway, this guy Hariri that I mentioned, he calls it, and he's very harsh with his terminology, or maybe just very direct with his terminology. But he talks about the, not just the unfilled class, but effectively from an economic standpoint, what he calls the useless class. So that's really, that's rough, right? That's rough language. But it's this idea that uh, there are folks who going forward into the future as tech starts to take over more and more uh, capabilities, that there are going to be folks that don't have a whole lot to contribute to the economy. And, and it may not even be entirely their fault, but they may not it's have the, the skills you know, needed. The so what do you do time. about that? Yeah, what do you do about that? And, it, and it's not clear what you do about that. It becomes a major issue for governments to think about, for society to think about. It's bigger than government. Um, and it's not clear. But that big problem can coexist with the Fed realize, thinking that, oh, man, you know, we're still seeing for those people that are competing in this labor force, we're still seeing, you know, an inflation push. So we're still going to raise rates. Um, we haven't had anybody at the Fed radical enough to, uh, to just credit people's checking accounts with money or something like that by printing it. That would be a whole other story. But, uh, but anyway, so, so that becomes a dilemma that they really can't solve. And, um, and, and so they continue on the traditional path. Looking at some other indicators, Raj, we thought just pulling out a couple of them, you know, going back to the employment side of the story. So whether or not people talk about unemployment rates, as we just said, like being accurate or covering the right aspect of the workforce, one thing is true, and that's the that non-farm payroll. So hiring, net hiring has been very high, and it's been very high for years. The average rate has been uh, close to 200,000 jobs a month uh, for almost 10 years. Uh, so it's actually one of the longest positive stretches like that, uh, you know, in the post-war era. So that's showing a lot of strength. What we see, if you look in this time, if you look at the graph on the left, we see that uh, non-farm payrolls tends to drop coming right into a recession, which, of course, makes sense. Uh, we've talked about it before as being sort of a lightweight leading indicator. Employment isn't typically thought of as a leading indicator, but in fact, it did predate a lot of the big crashes. Uh, even 2008, this drop was actually before the S&P totally unraveled. Um, and certainly in 2000, it happened again. So it's happened several times where it has been something of an indicator. And right now, we're not seeing that weakness yet. On the other side of the equation, on the business person side of the equation, the purchasing managers index is flying quite high still. It's come off maybe from its high, absolute highs, but a number above 50 indicates uh, expansion as far as the uh, purchasers and their companies are concerned. And uh, it's definitely still an expansion mode. Nowhere near 50, which would be considered a contraction. And so the strength in both of these areas, you know, that's giving the Fed more room to uh, go ahead and continue normalizing rates and uh, when they look at the real economy and, and not just the stock market. Yeah, and uh, you know, nothing in the stock market is impacting that CapEx spend. Right, hidden levers has been expanding. We find uh, other fintechs around us expanding, both in Atlanta and New York, uh, and uh, and then the big the big guns in uh, in financial services also expanding, hiring, etc. And so that cuts against this um, the the kind of market backdrop. Absolutely. Well, to touch on one other major sector of the economy, in terms of U.S. housing. Uh, Raj, you know, we thought it would be interesting. I, I know that you mentioned a couple of weeks ago that we should really touch on this idea of affordability. So maybe we can talk about that for a second and uh, how difficult this has gotten and maybe why that's led to sort of a breaking point in the, in the home market. Raj, I think you faded out on us. I'm not sure if others can hear him, but uh, the, uh, the essential thought that I wanted to get across or I thought was interesting in this slide is if we look at this idea of a home price to salary ratio, that's the bottom left. 
Greater Houston is one of the only metros, or it's the only metro in this sample, which isn't including every metro in the United States, but a lot of the major ones. Uh, it was the only one in the sample that had a home price to salary ratio below four. And uh, that's typically what's considered affordable. So imagine, you know, if you're trying to buy a uh, $400,000 home, well, that would imply that, you know, it would be good if your household income, and that's not just one person's income, but let's say a household income of 100000 would support that. That would be considered affordable. Uh, so Greater Houston is the only metro area in this sample set that includes that, whereas um, all of the others that you see there do not. And uh, the East Coast, D.C., the Bay Area, of course, is the other extreme, you know, with median home prices at a million dollars. Even though median salaries are high, over $100,000, they probably need to be a bit over double that to get to what would commonly be accepted as affordable. So this is part of the problem. And here's the thing. Back when rates were below 3.5%, or they were well below 4% at least, then it was essentially the banks that were bridging the gap by providing, you know, not just the banks, really the Federal Reserve, if we get back to it, but with the Fed providing cheap money, that was making it possible to, uh, for folks to continue to afford homes that would other otherwise be out of their league. Well, now as we get creep closer to 5% on rates, that ceases to be true. And, uh, and that further pressures, uh, pressures home buyers, which is, you know, as we see, it led to a slowdown this year in home sales. That's the blue line here, slowing down. Uh, one other factor that hasn't really been pointed out, I think it's really going to start getting felt more next year as people start to pay their taxes. Uh, but the tax law changes do have an impact here because uh, they reduce the kind of specific subsidy for home purchasing. So mortgage interest is still deductible. But because of the cap on uh, local, state and local taxes, including property taxes, if you're buying in any area which has substantial property taxes, and let's say you want to go buy a big fancy home and, and it comes with a $20,000 a year tax bill, well, you can't write that all off anymore. So that does effectively uh, raise the cost of home ownership. As well, all right, Roger, are you back with us? Yeah, that, that does apply to mortgage interest as well. So. I think the cap now is 10,000 on state and local taxes, as well as uh, property taxes, as well as uh, mortgage interest. So basically, the you know the dream of uh, home ownership is uh, has uh, turned into a nightmare for anybody living in New Jersey, especially or let's say California. You know, they because yeah, it definitely those, reduces the subsidy. Right, a lot of the a lot of the times the high earners there would use housing as a channel to create to create a, a deduction to get out of paying taxes and now that isn't that option isn't there and so you know we've right. got a housing scenario uh, along with the climate disasters you know there's a big uh, link there and so in january if there if there, you know if things didn't happen the way they did uh, our attention was quite needed for this anatomy of this correction going on uh, but we've been working under the covers on releasing a whole new asset class here at Hidden Levers uh, to stress test, and that is housing. Praveen, do you want to talk about that for a second? Yeah, I'll touch on it briefly. We were hoping to show you guys a sneak peek, but we're going to bring it to you in January, um, which is real estate modeling. So the idea that you'll be able to, as an advisor, you know, certainly almost all of your clients probably own a home. Many of them probably own real estate property as an investment as well. So having the ability to uh, include those investments from an analysis standpoint and see the impact of, you know, if I have 20% equity in my home, then really I've borrowed, you know, I've borrowed 80%. So therefore it's actually a leveraged investment, which a lot of folks don't realize. So actually being able to see all of that in our stress testing model um, and also see, you know, with, um, with investment properties, how, uh, you know, how that impacts rental yield and, uh, and things like that. So kind of being able to model that, uh, we haven't necessarily heard that from advisors. We'd certainly love to hear feedback as, you know, from, you know, what we're talking about today. But as you guys start to see it, if that's something that is, uh, is desired. But we felt like it's one of the largest asset classes that we don't cover. And, and so we felt for completeness, it was time to bring that into the fold. So that's coming in January. Yeah, and that, you know, for the, for the folks serving that mass affluent audience, definitely a home, either the first home or the combination of real estate ownership that is the uh, a huge line item on their on their P and L uh, 
their, their home P&L. So we, we definitely want to be able to stress test that. Uh, frankly, we're surprised that we get way more requests on, uh, you know, data feeds for annuities and uh, managed strategies over housing, which is something that uh, most folks that have uh, some sort of you know, wealth to be managed, they have that thing. And then, you know, it'll grow from there onto uh, full-on REITs. You know, if you're if you're looking at um, if you're looking at private placements into a REIT or other such uh, things with property value that are not so easy as uh, bundled assets. You know, they're individual assets. Maybe it's some sort of farmland. Maybe it's some sort of commercial real estate. Uh, you'll be able to do that here. And so that that definitely makes hidden levers uh, ten times more sophisticated than any risk tech out there because you're able to deal with property now and so you know there is right it was uh, added a complete there is a, the the notion of um, interest rates and how that affects it but also climate change and you know individual markets and how that how that deals with climate change vulnerability so for the first time we'll be starting to uh, map that for uh, for advisors and portfolio managers yeah absolutely i think it'll it'll be you know from a completeness standpoint will really help tell the story well, in terms of one of the, the, the last couple of risks, er, risk areas we'll look at, and then maybe we'll talk about, um, uh, you know, ab about the scenario and, uh, you know, what we see kind of in, um, in the trends in tech and the fangs and, and all of that a little bit more. But in terms of the global slowdown risks, one thing that maybe everybody hasn't been paying attention to, although you've probably seen it at the pump by now, uh, I certainly did. I think I paid 189 for my last uh, fill up this past weekend. So gas prices are getting cheaper. Well, there's a reason for it. That's because of this 35% slide for, you know, 30, I guess 30. And I think as of today, actually, that this chart didn't update yet. With further falls, you know, oil prices are down substantially. And um, and so this sort of big haircut on oil, well, it's triple the haircut on the S&P. And, uh, and what does that mean? Well, one of the things that that means is that it's not just U.S supply demand it's sort of a global thing the oil market is global that's what we see in this bottom left hand chart the blue line is world production and the uh, dark sort of gray line is world consumption and they, they look pretty much very close together right so it seems very subtle uh, but it's also pulled out in this lower chart where the, whenever this bar is above the graph that means that there's excess supply so it's, uh, oil is being stored in, in storage tanks and not being drawn down so this has been happening for a period of several months now, and or it's, it's really starting up and, it, and it, it's sort of expanding. The oil market is one of those markets where just even a 1% imbalance can lead to a huge drop in prices. And that's exactly what we're seeing now. We're seeing that imbalance where uh, consumers aren't buying as much as expected. And so oil prices end up hitting the chopping block because uh, producers can't hold on to oil for a really long time. They've got to pay to have it stored. So they're losing money that way. So they may as well sell it at a discount to keep it going. And by the way, their pumps are running 24 seven oil, oil wells are not typically, you know, part-time operations. So oil is coming out of the ground. You have to do something with it, which means you have to sell it for whatever price the market will bear. And so that's why small, uh, deltas where there's a little bit more production and consumption can lead to big drops like this. Uh, the other exacerbating factor, of course, is the, rise, the strength of the U.S. dollar. Because the dollar has been strong, that's going to force oil prices down as well. Uh, now, where is yeah, it coming from? Where is this sort of exacerbated that rise in the dollar? Yeah, absolutely. And, and well, another factor here is the right hand two thirds of this chart, right, which is that we see, um, you know, which we see EU slowdown. You know, relatively weak growth across the EU. That's Part of the problem you know so the, the brown line being the forecast to next year and so we see the drop out from 2017 sort of across the board and the eurozone as a whole slowing down more importantly we see this forward-looking forecast for china being uh, a downtrend and actually this was the world bank's forecast as of earlier in 2018 they've already missed this number that's current the 6.5 for uh, in q3 of 2018 uh, they actually hit 6.2 so they're already at the low end of this range. I think that was a note that's supposed to go in there. But um, yeah, China is is missing its own GDP projections and estimates or forecast. 
And, uh, and so that's being felt in oil markets. So between so that and then, that, of course, all of these. That is, uh, that's propelled many markets lower, Praveen, uh, you know, creating softness. Uh, I, I'd say that was one of the turbo boosts affecting the crash here uh, in U.S. markets, uh, not to mention um, uh, uh, cryptocurrency. You know, that, right. that China um, GDP number is so intertwined with um, uh, risk assets. Right. Well, we had a question about at what point does unemployment start to increase due to lower oil prices, uh, which is an interesting question. It's, it, it used to be that when oil was cheap, that that was unabashedly good for the United States because we imported so much of it, the cheaper we could get it, the more it powered our economy. So now we're, we're not yet at the point where it's exact balance, but because the United States is uh, forecast. Uh, I mean, it's kind of varying by month, but we're basically tied with Saudi Arabia now for being the number one producer in the world. And so because we're such a big producer, there are a lot of jobs that, that do depend on it. Uh, at the same time, we are still a net importer. So that means we're still buying more oil than we produce, which means on net, we're not probably quite at the point where cheap oil is bad, but we're getting closer and closer to this point where when we are at, let's say, zero net imports, where oil prices kind of don't matter to the United States. High oil prices mean that Texas and Oklahoma and you know other states, Alaska, Louisiana, that they do really well and other states do really poorly. And then on the flip side, low oil prices mean that those oil, oil patch states do poorly and other states do really well. Um, right now, the balance is in favor of the oil consuming states, but we're getting closer and closer to the balance point where oil is sort of not correlated with the US economy, I would argue at all. It washes out. Uh, another question, do we really believe that Chinese GDP is over 6%? It is, it, the books are cooked without a doubt. Um, now, as to, we haven't done a lot of work on our end, you know, as far as specific forecasts of where it actually is. Uh, there is a reality. So we, we know that there are certain things that are real and you can, you can look those up like uh, Chinese electric grid, uh, you know, actual utilization, the amount of cement, that's a popular one that's tracked, the amount of cement and copper, and you know, there are certain raw materials that, that China is importing. So there are ways to sort of back into it. And, and at least from what I had seen, Recently, although we didn't look this up for the purposes of today's presentation, um, the third party forecasts you'll see are lower than this, but they're not like half. They're like a percentage point lower. So, which would still keep China in, um, you know, substantially ahead of the United States and Europe and, and you know, major economies. So it would still be the world's fastest uh, growing large economy. Uh, depending on where you draw that line. India is growing faster, but it's a substantially smaller economy still. Um, and so, uh, but yeah, but but I think the, the general point is true, which is that China is teetering in a couple of different ways. They're growing slower than these numbers indicate. They're missing their own estimates. And, uh, you know, if they stop propping things up, then, you know, is there more risk, uh, you know, being, being covered up? The trade issues, you know, the trade, the tariffs have been having a material impact over there. Uh, as much as anything, it's about, you know, you start to see companies begin to shift to Vietnam and Malaysia and Bangladesh and wherever they can find a place where there's no tariff because the margins on some of the products that are being produced are very, very low. So a 25% tariff or even a 10% tariff uh, sends people into the negative. So, uh, so you, you do see the impacts of that. All right, Raj, well, let's move now to tech because really at the end of the day, this is a, a big story that's only powering forward over time. Yeah, if you remember from uh, the end of October, beginning of November, we were talking about the sunset on the business cycle. And one of the kind of indicators was that was easy was looking at where um, technology is as a, uh, you know, how big a slice of the S&P pie is tech. Well, you know, when it was in the high 20s, about a third of tech, um, that was the time for a crash. And so, you know, is that the case now? And so we see what's happening, right? Getting into these lofty areas. But one way is uh, technology is a huge component of the economy. And so uh, well into the 20s, whereas you can see that, you know, you can zoom in there if you want, Praveen, but it's um, in the high 20s again. And so is that going, is that a, 
time when things have gotten too lofty and it's time to correct. Well, that is a momentary thing, my friend. You know, tech, like the other industries amongst us, right? We've seen it um, in in other industries, uh, the shale consolidation after the boom and bust, uh, telecom consolidation in the 90s after the kind of boom and bust, and you know, so, somewhat of a corporate Darwinism there. And so here too, uh, the, the biggest example we can think of is, you know, don't confuse the momentary leadership with the growth of the pie. And so, so to me, the biggest example of that was the too big to fail banks, right? Let's just say 2007, um, uh, you can see there a chart uh, that, uh, you know, on the kind of top right of the big banks and which of them got gobbled up. Uh, and now in 2017, 2018, what are the largest banks? Some of the names you recognize, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, they're far uh, bigger than they were ever uh, in the, the highs of 2007 before the banking crisis. And what's happened is Bear Stearns went away. Uh, Wells Fargo gobbled up uh, countrywide. Some of those other names around housing that were plagued went away. Uh, but the, the giants, the, the kind of monopolistic um, uh, you know, juggernauts, they're still there and only bigger. They're not only bigger than um, their counterparts, they're bigger than they ever were, than the, you know, than the whole industry. So it's grown. And so compare that, you know, it wasn't just the financial crisis of 2007 compared to now. It's not just a decade of analysis. You look at the lower left, back from 1970, the top five banks were about 17% of the pie. And, uh, you know, earlier this decade, there, there's uh, over 50% already. And so that's only grown. Uh, and this kind of monopolistic tendency that maybe it's just part of, um, it, it's just a part of every industry. And just the, the arc of, of uh, American entrepreneurship, maybe global entrepreneurship, you know, these, it's not so much uh, a competitive landscape that's littered with players, right? It becomes, as Praveen mentioned earlier, kind of a duopoly or an oligopoly. And so that's, that's exactly what's happening in tech, right? Today we have Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google. But I really don't care about that kind of conglomeration because it's momentary. You know, if Facebook, if the world uh, hate toward Facebook continues and you have activist investors and regular investors wanting to put that down, if there's lawsuit after lawsuit, uh, then, you know, you can say maybe it goes the way of America Online or maybe it goes the way of Nixon, just, uh, just shamed into non-existence, right? Whatever the case is, it's not so much about one tech juggernaut because Bear Stearns was a tech, was a banking juggernaut that now is a shadow, but it lives within the greater asset pool of uh, J.P. Morgan and, and the other banks. And so those big banks, you know, their capital levels, you can see there, has doubled in the past decade. Their assets under management has doubled in the past decade, and they've, the two big to fail banks are bigger than they've ever been. So you know, try and analogize that to where tech is headed. No matter what happens with that thing, no matter how bad this correction gets, uh, you know, you see that that kind of software eating the world story intact. And so, whereas yes, it is a moment of concern where uh, the percentage of the pie that tech occupies on the S and P is in the high 20s again, and will it stay? You know, but the real story is if there is a robot takeover, that's the Bill Gates way to say it. Or if there is software eating the world, that's the Phil, uh, Peter Thiel way to say it. If that keeps happening, um, then we're headed to a place where tech only becomes a, a bigger part of the economy. And maybe you do have more convergence between S&P and, and NASDAQ, or that, that kind of distinction is, becomes irrelevant. And so, you know, whatever your long-term goals are, if you have younger clients or people not retiring tomorrow, that tech story is only growing. It may be fewer names. It may be different names at the top, the same way that the fangs of today are different than the Cisco's and the Oracle kind of, you know, which are more boring stories these days. They're not as exciting. So just that same way, the, the, the fang of today may not be the leadership tomorrow, but, you know, for sure, it looks like that story, that, that, that part of the pie is only growing. So there is an upside here. Even even with these uh, 
you know, bleeding red tech, uh, tech right. equities. And even with sort of a momentary correction, you know, there's, there's that longer, larger trend is in place. Well, let's let's move to talk about, you know, so we wanted to highlight that tech bubble. And I think, you know, perhaps um, the discussion on Facebook is uh, is apropos because they're down so much today with more with more issues they're disclosing. But but it's not just them, all the things and they've been sort of leading the way down. And uh, and so we thought it appropriate amongst all the risks that we're talking about, that this is the one that is worth focusing in on a little bit more and updating. Uh, also, because it fits the story that we consider now to be a, a not unlikely baseline scenario uh, in today's environment, which is this idea of a bull market correction, you know, which we're already in, but which may have a little more downside to it before we recover. So that's this idea in the middle here of uh, a NASDAQ correction down to the 6,000 range and S&P down to 2350. And, and frankly, a few more days like today and we'll be at these levels. Uh, but this is the kind of correction, you know, if we measure it from the top to this point is uh, still not quite like 1987, but it's sort of on the moderate scale when it comes to corrections that happen within the context of a, um, of a healthy economy. So happened plenty of times before, could happen again. And, and then Raj, to your point, you were talking kind of through the ugly points, this idea that the FANG ceased to be a term because even though software is continuing to grow. Individual leading tech companies may fall out of favor. And I suppose this could happen in either play, but with this idea of peak fang, that these leading tech companies, that their valuations correcting, and that was what we looked at in that valuation slide, if those correct down to fair value. And what we typically see in corrections is that you shoot below fair value before, rebound, before you rebound back to exact fair value. So another 25%. So bear in mind, these numbers are from the close yesterday. Uh, but that would be another 25, 26% from the close yesterday. So NASDAQ 5,000, which we chose that number. Many of you uh, will remember the 2,000 highs. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, sort of resistance at that level. Uh, and, well, resistance from one side and support at that, at that level from, from here because we've got 5,000 that was that all-time high at the time in 2000 and then broke through that um, several years ago. I guess was that maybe 2013 or so as we started rocketing up here. So, so that yeah, becomes the downside target. Just pulled out of the sky. You know, they're very much uh, the technical support and resistance levels that we've had that are multi-year support and resistance levels. And so. Right. Yeah. In that case. particular case, that one goes back 18 years. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's still another 20, roughly 25, 26% down from here. Um, the flip side of that, the good scenario and Raj, that was, I guess, what you're talking about in terms of software eating the world and tech companies continuing to consolidate akin to the big banks. Uh, and that may lead to some incremental upside. It's important to note, you know, while we're looking at 25%, 18% on the S&P from here, um, that's mostly just covering ground we've already covered, you know, because your all-time high on the S&P was only about 3% away from 3,000. Uh, but that's just... Uh, and nod to the fact that, hey, valuations had gotten very stretched by September of this year. And, and so is it possible to get back to that place? Yes. Uh, we're not currently seeing a roadmap. We were talking about it earlier today, right, Raj? And we're not seeing a roadmap to how you get to, um, you know, 20, 30, 40 percent uh, in the near term, you know, sort of explosive upside. You still do see some of the Wall Street banks calling for the S&P at 3,500 or, or more. And uh, that seems quite challenging given um, the global backdrop, given the, um, the fact that the tax cuts are kind of in the past tense now and you don't get that boost again. Uh, so, so that seems challenging, but that doesn't mean that there isn't an upside story that's solid. It's just, it seems like the runaway kind of continuation may be a little more. Yeah, especially of, uh, when you have such beleaguered fundamentals on some of these guys. You know, there is talk about the ad model um, the, the ad revenue model because of certain privacy issues, all that kind of stuff going away, right? That, that's extreme, but you know, if, if the expectations on that is diminished, then how, how do some of these ad driven technology companies uh, uh, go forward? You know, and so uh, the idea of the fangs, I, I just really want to emphasize that that's, that's a new thing, right? And if, if even the tech leadership of the 2000 
the late 90s bubble. Do, I mean, I bet you have uh, so many of, uh, of today's traders and investors and uh, financial professionals can't name the five juggernauts of uh, tech in the late 90s, right? So that's one uh, chink in the armor of the current fangs already. Uh, and then on top of that, you have huge technology companies, you know, names that have been around 100 years at least, GE and IBM, uh, both in the doghouse. And so, you know, what makes Facebook invincible? What makes a Netflix invincible there? Absolutely. Um, I know just for context, for those who um, are curious, you know, we do have this even more ugly historical 2000 tech crash. But what I thought interesting about it and pulling up the numbers, and this is sort of the historical crash from um, March 2000 to April 2001, the S&P was actually only down 21% over that time frame, but the NASDAQ was down, if I pull it up here, the NASDAQ, which is here, was down 65% over that time frame. So that was an example of extreme divergence between the two indices. We don't see that anymore because software um, is a more sort of real part of every company's business, uh, but also, uh, you know, the real tech companies today, that are the, not just the things, but so many of them do have positive earnings, you know, not just a burn rate. So a little, a little less crazy than that here. All right. Well, let's touch on the, uh, there's our takeaways, Raj, before we, we call it a wraps on 2018 and head into 2019. Yeah, plenty to look forward to in, uh, in 2019. You know, we did want to examine some of the, the correction, both uh, create an anatomy of what's happening and uh, talk about the divergence from the economy uh, in terms of the outlook. Um, are there any questions on this stuff? We do have a question on how much cash the tech companies can repatriate. Um, last I heard, only 5% of $3 trillion had been repatriated. It's a good question. We should follow up on the exact numbers. I will say $3 trillion sounds high only because the combined market caps of the FANGs, at least, uh, is less than that number. So they don't have that much in aggregate cash. Although they do certainly have substantial cash balances. I mean, Apple alone, of course, has a couple hundred billion. So there is, there is a lot of cash floating out there. Um, increasingly, what's interesting about it that I would note is that a lot of these companies, what they like to do is they like to pay dividends to their American investors. And so those dividend checks have to get cut in the United States. Uh, so what they end up doing is they're holding all of this cash off the books overseas, and they are simultaneously borrowing in U.S. capital markets in order to pay dividends. Apple does this, but they're not the only one. Plenty of companies do it. Uh, so they keep the two, you know, uh, if, you, if you ever go and look at the earning report, you'll see um you can't you know sort of balancing line items where they've got all this cash and then they've also got all of this short-term debt um and that's the result of the fact that they're keeping the two ba you know keep, keeping the two separate and that's enabling them to pay dividends at least in apple's case obviously some of the others don't pay dividends uh, but it's not an uncommon practice and, uh, and and so some of that is getting secretly netted away it's not all um uh missing and not unrepatriated it's just been repatriated via financial trick all right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We are excited about uh, 2019 in terms of our own outlook. Hidden Levers is just passing 20 employees for the first time. Uh, so, you know, we're not growing as fast as uh, other tech companies in terms of headcount. But in terms of our functionality, capability, prowess, and clout in the market, absolutely, you know, far and beyond, uh, we'll have you know. Uh, 2019 is looking pretty good. Uh, we've got a whole second line of business emerging now in the risk monitor, which is uh, aggregate analytics for uh, roll-up type shops, or if you're growing in headcount, uh, if you're growing in accounts, but you don't want to grow in headcount, so sort of a digital risk officer doing more aggregate analytics, not much client facing there, much more about business intelligence. If you're interested in that, uh, being an early adopter there, uh, talk to us uh, about the risk monitor, both revenue monitoring, your own KPIs, that kind of thing. And then this whole real estate push, uh, which will be pretty uh, pretty excellent for the folks that are uh, dealing with REITs or for a lot of um, uh, high net worth clients or folks with a lot of real estate on their books that want to, uh, or, or even prospects, where you can get an edge on being able to stress test the real estate and give some value add to that conversation, whether they're your client yet or not. Uh, but for myself, Praveen, and our... Uh, Merry band of, uh, of tech fiends over here in Atlanta. 
I do thank you and uh, have a happy holiday and, and new year. We'll see you again in January 2019 when we discuss U.S. housing. Thanks, everyone.